Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so it is indeed uh, this evening uh, the X-ray special of us from your tap. There's actually a little history behind uh, this X-ray special, which is actually uh, history with a big H. That is um, the year 2019 is a special year for X-ray astronomy uh, in at least two ways, but I hope three. Um, one way is it's because we're actually um, um, 2019 is the, the, the 70th birthday of X-ray astronomy from the X first X-ray photons uh, coming from the uh, outside the atmosphere that we could observe. And it's also the 20th birthday of the two uh, current most successful um, X-ray observatories, uh, so Chandra, shown here on the right, and XMM on the left, uh, from the um, um, NASA on the, on the right and, and the European Space Agency on the left. And the third reason is it's also the, the birthday, so the launch of a new X-ray satellite that Thomas will talk about later called Erosita. And I hope it will make history uh, at least as much as those here. Okay, um, so the first question might be, okay, why only 70 years of X-ray astronomy? Uh, so we've done astronomy since uh, centuries and even with instruments in the optical, like uh, since Galileo, uh, several hundred years ago. Um, so the main reason is the fact that uh, before, um, roughly a bit more than 100 years ago, we didn't know of X-rays. And uh, as most uh, German people folk, uh, or German folks here would know, uh, the discovery of um, X-ray radiation was done by uh, Wilhelm Hongen um, in 1895. Um, <clears throat> And it was not even sure when that happened what, this, what was the nature of this radiation. It took a while to confirm that it was actually photons like the one we see in optical light, but just with higher energies. And that was um, essentially the main confirmation come, uh, came almost 20 years later by all those people shown here on the left. Um, by uh, diffracting X-rays on crystals and being able to identify the sort of wavelengths uh, uh, range that we were talking about. Now there's a second reason why X-ray astronomy took a while to take off, and that's a technical reason. And that is because um, X-rays are not so easy to observe, and uh, for two reasons. One of them is just simply they don't go through the atmosphere. So if you look on the right here, you have a small scheme as a function of wavelengths, you have the wavelengths uh, uh, on the top of um, uh, photons from um, gamma emission, the, the most energetic ones, to radio, the, the least energetic ones. And you see that there, you have only two, optical, two, two window bands in the radio and optical where the light reaches uh, the ground. For all other observations with photons, you need to go higher up the atmosphere. And for the X-ray, the threshold, as you can see on that plot, is roughly 100 kilometers. So you need to be able to fly a rocket or a satellite to observe them. The second reason is they are also challenging to detect. And uh, basically, uh, that's because they're so energetic that they behave like particles, energetic particles that essentially go through anything. And it's very difficult to both focus them and detect them. So you have here um, two small um, examples on the left on, on how you could detect them. Uh, the simplest version that was available in the early years of X-ray astronomy was a simple collimator. That is, if you use a tube that is absorbing X-rays and long enough uh, that only um, X-rays coming from small angles can uh, pass through, then you know roughly from which direction the X-ray comes. So it's not a focusing instrument, but that's an instrument that tells you where the photons come from. And the second one is how to detect them afterwards, and that was using proportional counters that is uh, the same thing as a Geiger counter for particles, where essentially uh, photons going through gas would just uh, release a cloud of uh, electrons who are gathered by an electrical uh, dipole. And uh, by measuring how, mu how many electrons and the charge that you was liberated, you can measure the energy of the photon. Okay, so with those methods, the first X-ray observation uh, were reached um, shortly after World War II in 1949, so 70 years ago. And um, the technology behind that, there's also a small story involving Germany, which is that uh, that's actually the birth of all space science, 
that was made from V2 rockets that were made by the uh, German Third Reich, usually um, initially as weapons, but that were then distributed between uh, uh, essentially the US and Russia to use for different purposes, and one of them was scientific exploration. So these people, like uh, here Herbert Friedman, uh, who um, published the first discovery, um, put proportional counters on V2 rockets and managed uh, to confirm that uh, X-ray could be observed outside the atmosphere in the direction of the sun. Now, unfortunately, the um, sort of flux that could be observed also confirmed that if you want to look at other stars than the sun, it's extremely difficult to do and would not be done before decades. And so um, there were uh, many people lost interest in the X-rays at that point, and just few teams carried on uh, thinking of the potential for discovery um, when, when we could use those radiation for, for further observation, for further scientific investigation. And one of the team um, which um, went on with X-ray observation was led by uh, Riccardo Giacconi, uh, and uh, they managed uh, already 13 years later to detect another X-ray source. Uh, actually, um, that's not the X-ray source they were targeting in that observation. So the idea behind it was to study X-ray radiation from the moon. That was partly funded by the army um, uh, with the idea also to study X-ray radiation outside uh, the atmosphere to check for the possible um, um, observation or impact of uh, nuclear weapons, but also from the moon with the idea of the upcoming um, program to put people on the moon to make sure the radiation environment there was good enough for people to survive. But doing that, they did not observe X-ray from the moon, as you can see from that diagram here on the right, uh, which shows as a function of direction that the instrument was scanning, uh, the X-ray, the number of photons that were, were recorded. And you see that the position of the moon, highlighted by the, the arrow here on the top, is offset from the main peak. And that new source that was later called SCO X1, for Scorpius X1, is actually a source in the constellation of Scorpius. Now, of course, people wanted to know what the source was. And looking at the optical data, which you have here on the right, it was not so obvious to know what sort of sources people were looking at. Uh, you had all sort of normal stars and nothing special. Uh, maybe the bright uh, Antares, uh, kind of one of the bright stars in the sky, but without any good reason why it would be so much brighter in the X-rays than the sun. And it took several years to confirm what was the, actually the source of those X-rays. And that's this tiny red circle that you see here on the top. Um, that's a, a star that you barely see in the optical. And actually, it turned out that it's uh, not a normal star, it's a neutron star. So a neutron star is a result from the end of life of a star, when actually um, the star starts to compress and may become, uh, the pressure may become so large that um, the electrons and the protons start to uh, fuse uh, together and, and uh, create neutrons. And those stars, they are very compact, obviously. Um, and um, they also have a very strong magnetic field, as you can see an illustration with the lines here on the right. And those magnetic fields are partly the reason why you have strong collimated jets at the poles of those stars. Now, um, SCO X1 is a neutron star, but it's not only a neutron star, it's a neutron star in a binary system. That is, as you can see at the bottom here on the left, um, that the neutron star has a companion and that the neutron star is so dense and massive that it attracts matter from the companion that is slowly heated up and accreting um, the main object. And that creates a lot of X-rays from the very hot conditions in this accreting material. Yeah, so that was the first object. It's not the only one that could be observed, but once you had one, then people wanted to make a satellite and were more motivated to make real uh, ambitious projects uh, to detect more of them. And so one of these ambitious projects came several years later with the Uhuru satellite in the 1970, which was also led by Ricardo Giacconi. And um, it was still the same sort of technology as before, but from space, and uh, improved. And it um, resulted in the 
detection with the all sky survey of 339 X-ray sources. Um, many of um, those here highlighted with arrows and with their names, and not all of them obviously were neutron stars. They discovered new sort of sources. So the main kind of X-ray emitters that people see in this kind of large scale surveys are those here. Um, in the galactic plane, one can see X-ray emission coming from the revenants of old supernovae. So you have an example here on the right of the um, crab uh, remnant. Uh, that's an optical image. Uh, at that point, we still don't have imaging instruments um, with um, or, um, imaging instruments in the X-rays. So that's the sort of object you see, and the explosion obviously creates a lot of very hot material with relativistic particles also that emits a lot of X-rays. And the other kind of galaxy, clus galaxy clusters that you see on the left, that's the optical image with 100 to 1,000 of galaxies concentrated on the same area of the sky, and that's also an area, a region where, from which a lot of X-ray radiation come because there is a lot of diffuse gas in between the galaxies, and this gas is heated up to very high temperatures by uh, the gravitational potential of the system. So there was an interesting project a few, few years later called the High Energy Astrophysical Observatory in the US. Um, in several stages, one of them was to make a new all-sky survey detecting more sources. And you see here the roughly 1,000 sources available at the time, sorted by different categories. So you recognize in blue the supernova remnants, in green the binary systems like the um, score X1, for instance, in pink clusters. But you also see active galactic nuclei, which are accretion on supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies instead of neutron stars. Much more powerful. And this was complemented with the first imaging telescope uh, called Einstein, um, so the second step of the mission, which used a new method uh, where X-rays could be focused by um, using grazing incidence on reflecting material, and which was much more efficient to focus X-rays. And with that, they managed to make real images. So you have here the first images performed of um, X-ray systems, just a subset of them. On the right here, you see the coma galaxy cluster. So that's the one I was showing before. The small um, insert here on the bottom uh, shows the optical image to show you the scale. And it's like this huge diffuse emission from the hot gas in the cluster. And what you can see on the left is a supernova remnant observed in the X-rays. That's the Tycho supernova remnant, observed by famous astronomer Tycho Brahe in the um, 16th century. And yeah, so that, that were the first sort of images you got. Um, and the final step in the history leading to XMM and Chandra was the Rosat satellite, which uncovered 100,000 of sources um, with similar technologies behind it, but performing a whole sky survey with an imaging telescope for the first time. So lots of science to be done here. And in terms of catalogs, that's still the reference to date where most of the bright sources in the sky come from and the statistically well-selected sample come from. Couple of highlights from Rosat. You have here on the right an example of the uh, emission uh, color coded with different X-ray energy, the emission over the whole sky, and there was lots of studies to be done with the X-ray background, also on large scale, from the galaxy. And you see this different sort of structure coming from uh, the direction of the galactic center in green here. And on the left, that's an iconic image of the X-ray emission from the moon, where you can see uh, on the illuminated part of the moon reflection from X-rays coming from the sun. And that's actually what the Giacconi team was trying to measure uh, decades earlier uh, in their first experiment. And interestingly, also some X-rays coming from the dark side of the moon. Now, the current generation of satellite with XMM and Chandra um, was launched in 1999, so 20 years ago. What was new with those uh, satellites is they had um, large mirrors with large collecting areas able to study a broad range of photon energies, but also they had new sort of detectors, basically CCD cameras, the same you use in your um, um, cameras, uh, private cameras, except that they were tuned to detect X-rays. And that means you get a much more um, detailed um, information on the, the position and energy of the photons that you detect. So um, the main difference between those two instruments, apart from being flown by the NASA and ESA, 
is that the Chandra X-ray satellite has an exquisite spatial resolution. So you could do imaging to a very great amount of details to a one arc second resolution, as you can see here at the bottom. While XMM has a bit worse imaging capabilities, six arc second, but much better resolution than uh, ROSAT, which had five times larger uh, uh, point spread function, so the resolution of the instrument. Uh, however, XMM is by far the instrument with the largest collecting area ever published, uh, ever flown, uh, with the 1,500 centimeters squared. So this effective area is effective, effectively the, the measurement of which area of uh, um, a detector would be used to detect all the photons going through. That's a measurement on how, how many photons you detect from a given source. And Chandra has a, a bit worse effective area uh, with also a smaller field of view and a smaller spread in the photon wavelengths that it can study. But both have very excellent effective area and sensitivity compared to the old ROSAT uh, satellite. Now I will go through some results from those two instruments and you will see the difference in the sort of imaging um, capabilities that you can get from them. You have here example from the uh, solar system. So on the right you can see emission from the planet Mars detected by XMM, and there was a really a surprise there when it was done for the first time that X-rays were detected from much further out of ma the Mars atmosphere that was expected, the Martian at atmosphere, uh, meaning that um, the atmosphere is still there very far away from Mars and still interacting with the solar X-rays. Um, some nice image that was done with a combined study of XMM and Chandra was to uh, an investigation of the polar auroras of Jupiter, as you can see here in blue on the top of the, the image in the center. Very similar to the sort of uh, uh, polar auroras we see on Earth, but um, enabling to study the chemical composition of the um, atmosphere of Jupiter uh, at those locations. And um, X-rays from comets have been detected also. Um, that's here on the, the left, an example from Chandra where you see the optical image in the background, and in pink, the X-ray observation. And that can be used to study both the chemical composition of the comets, which are a good um, um, probe of the chemical condition early on in our solar system. But also, you can study the composition of the, the solar winds that interact with them to create those X-rays. So moving to, to larger scales, um, you have here on the left an example of an intermediate mass black hole that is a black hole uh, of stellar size coming from a star initially. And um, that's an example of the sort of uh, nice spectrum you can do from such a uh, telescope, that's from XBM here. And this uh, spectrum just shows the energy that you record at different wavelengths or different photon energies. And you can see all sort of lines and absorption features that tell you about the chemical composition of the outflow, so the region surrounding the black holes and coming outside in jet. And um, actually, the Doppler shift of those lines could be used to measure the speed of the outflow, finding that the outflow travels at 20% the speed of light, so huge speeds. On the right is a bit of a different object because these are two merging galaxies. So you see in red the optical image of those two merging galaxies. And in the center in blue, what you see is the central black holes of those galaxies. So not at all the same sort of black holes as we were discussing uh, so far, but the ones that actually pour active galactic nuclei in the center of galaxies. And those two black holes haven't merged yet. And it can be seen that you have actually two black holes interacting with the surrounding material. Uh, it was the blue insets here of the Chandra image. Some other nice results. Uh, I must say most of the imaging here is biased toward Chandra because of the nice imaging capabilities. But in terms of science, the two instruments actually were equally important. You have here an image of the Tycho supernovae on the right, which you can compare with the image obtained by the Einstein Observatory shown earlier on, and the great details that was were observed. The, it's all X-rays here. The color comes from the different X-ray energies. And on the left, as a comparison, you have an example of another supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, uh, which does not come from the same type of supernovae. So this, the one on the left, comes from the end la of life of a very massive star that becomes unstable. Um, and the, the one on the right comes from two interacting uh, stars, with one becoming unstable as it accretes the matter from the other. 
One nice thing from the uh, Cassiopeia supernovae here is this bright spot you can see in the center, which is a direct observation of the neutron star that results from the core of the supernova uh, as the massive star collapsed. Yeah, um, coming back to the Crab Nebula, which is another supernova remnant, you have an image here on the right in purple pink, which shows the optical and infrared emission. And now you have the Chandra observation in blue, filling up the empty region with hot energetic material. And that's actually not only energetic material, but it's also a pulsar there. So a pulsar is a, essentially a rotating, rotating neutron star, which can be observed as pulses as the jet passes through your field of view. And um, you can see here um, the direction of the jets from the upper right to the uh, upper left to the lower right. And you have a zoom in uh, in the middle in blue with an observation by the HST of the um, material in the optical. And uh, that's actually interesting because that was observed several times uh, with some delay between them. And one could see fluctuations in the outflow, but also in waves propagating uh, perpendicular to the, the jets inside the surrounding material. Now, galaxy clusters is actually what I'm working on and was also a field that was completely transformed with XMM and Chandra. You have here nice images uh, by uh, Chandra, which shows the central parts of the Perseus galaxy cluster, one of the most massive local galaxy clusters. And the uh, nice resolution of Chandra revealed those sort of bubble that you can see in the right. And uh, red contours, they do not highlight just the, the bubble, so the holes in the X-ray emission. They actually come from radio observation. Radio observation which probed the interaction of very energetic relativistic material with the local magnetic fields. And so what that means is essentially those bubbles are carved by uh, relativistic material uh, coming from the center of the galaxy clusters. And that is actually because uh, most galaxy clusters have a very massive galaxy in the center where there is a strong active galactic nuclei. And sorry, the outburst from this active galactic nuclei is able to push out the, the hot gas in the intracluster medium. What you can see on the left here is an image of the same cluster. You may recognize in the very center the shape of the two bubbles that were shown on the right. Uh, but if you look at larger scale, you could see this kind of spiraling structure, which is a uh, wave propagating inside the uh, intracluster medium, this hot gas. So um, galaxy clusters were also used, in particular with XMM and Chandra, to probe the mysterious dark matter. That is because those objects are, are dominated by dark matter, despite having this very um, um, large amount of hot gas inside them. And uh, that could be seen in two ways. One of them is the picture on the right, which shows as a function of the size you probe, the radius you probe in the galaxy cluster, what's the total mass that is included inside that radius. Uh, and you have different components here. You have the stars in, in uh, yellow um, that come from optical observation. In red, um, sorry, uh, in orange, oh. in orange you have the, um, the baryons or the gas measurements. And um, the total of those, um, the whole normal matter, uh, is shown in red as a fraction of the total mass measured um, by other means. And what you can see here is that when you sum up the mass in the stars and in the gas, you don't reach the total mass of the system. You reach about 10%, 0.1 here on that plot. And that shows the existence of that matter in galaxy clusters. But also on the picture on the left, what is very interesting is one could show by using gravitational lensing here in blue to locate where the total mass of the system is, that it's actually offset from the major component of the, the normal matter, uh, which is shown by the X-ray emission in pink. And that's one of the most direct evidence for the existence of that matter, that the two are not at the same location. And it's very difficult to get from just um, modified theory of gravity to explain that matter. 
final results from those two satellites, the cosmic X-ray background and the survey uh, science. So um, you have here on the right a very deep image from the Chandra Deep Field South where you observe many, many sources. And that's an extragalactic field of very small size. So you have a comparison here. Um, if you de-zoom the image, you get this small white box here compared to the size of the moon. So that's a tiny part of the, of the sky. And in that part of the sky, you see all the sources, which are, to a vast majority, active galactic nuclei in very distant, um, in very distant uh, galaxies. And XMM has been able to also uh, increase that knowledge by covering a larger area to uh, significant depths, as you can see in blue here. The scale in size is the same compared to the small white box. And that enabled to probe the distribution in flux and the density of active galactic nuclei in the universe in general, which could be shown to constitute most of the cosmic X-ray background. And so now all this background is kind of understood and resolved into discrete sources with active galactic nuclei. So the conclusion on X-ray astronomy and XMM and Chandra. One is X-ray astronomy is still a young science. There are still plenty of things to do. And that by using X-ray, we probe the, the hottest and the most violent region of the universe. And there's very interesting science that you can only do with the X-rays. Uh, in this framework, uh, Chandra and XMM have really been a game changer in that um, in essentially any field where X-rays could be used, uh, they, they completely changed and they are just the ground basis of our current knowledge. But one drawback they have is that they still cover only a relatively small portion of the sky compared to um, the whole sky. And that's uh, what Erosita is expected to change. And I hope Thomas will tell us very interesting things about that uh, in a few minutes. Thank you for your attention.